Yo, so we're back once again with another mind map. This time we're doing this for the chapter on blood. And if you've ever had to take uh, anatomy and physiology or phlebotomy or some any other class that deals with understanding blood and um, the human body, then you might have noticed that the chapter is really short. And usually we translate short chapter with easy chapter. But what I've begun noticing lately when students test on this chapter is they've not been doing too well on it. I don't know what's up. I mean, I've been teaching this chapter for nearly uh, 12 years, and most of those years people ace this chapter. For the last two or three years, people have been really flubbing up on the chapter. And the f crazy thing about it is not a lot of information has changed on the heart. I mean, not the heart, but the uh, but blood just some basic numbers and some ratios and things like that. So um, I start talking to students, came to find out, you know, it's really difficult to get your footing in the chapter because, yeah, the chapter is about blood, but it's about a lot of other things that concern the blood. So I, I put together this really crude mind map here to kind of talk about some items. And if you look at the blood, I've got uh, five areas in the blood that you want to be able to concern yourself with if you're studying for an exam. Transportation, regulation, protection, characteristics, and last but not least, uh, whole blood or the composition of blood. So let's kind of do uh, clockwise. We can start with the composition down here. When you're talking about blood and you're referring to blood that has actually been taken from an individual, has not been treated in a lab, hasn't been placed into a centrifuge and spun down and had things removed and had things added. If you talk about that, that's called whole blood. And whole blood is nothing more than plasma plus formed elements. So you're talking about the liquid portion of blood plus the solid portion of blood equaling whole blood. And plasma is mostly water. Some textbooks tell you that plasma can be anywhere up to 92% nothing but water. So um, for those of you out there, my sci-fi fans, if you ever watch the movie or the television series Dune, D-U-N-E, let the spice flow for my people out there who are sci-fi fans. But uh, if you know about plasma and you know about that series, you know that most of the body is made out of water. How are they able to harvest water? from people like that, it was because almost 92% of your plasma is nothing but water. So drinking water is ideal, it is very key. And solutes are nothing more than things that can dissolve in water or things that are soluble in water. And that's a lot of stuff when you're talking about the blood. Formed elements is just talking about these three things, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And we will talk about them a little more in detail when we go around the circle. So then we talk about transportation. You know, the blood is like the interest. The, it's, it's, it's a carrier in your body. Um, I would say that arteries, veins, and capillaries are like the interstate of the body. They're the um, interstate, the highways, and the main roads, the thoroughfares, the little cut streets, um, back, back alleys of the different neighborhoods of your body. And the blood is kind of like uh, almost like a train or, or a martyr rail. You know, I'm from ATL, Atlanta. So we have the martyr train. We have the martyr buses. You know how we roll. We got the you go to other places. You got the metro. So that's transportation. Blood helps carry things around in your body. If something wants to get from point A to point B, they typically want to jump into blood. Unless you're talking about something that's specialized, like an action potential, a nerve signal, which doesn't travel through blood, but it travels through nerve fibers. So some of the things that we transport in our blood are things like gases. Specifically, we'll probably talk about oxygen and carbon dioxide when you start talking about anatomy and physiology. Um, it's not the only gas in your blood, but it's the two primary gases that we concern ourselves with. Because if you imbalance these two gases, pretty much you're going to die. So we don't want to do that. Oxygen and carbon dioxide do not travel by themselves. The vast majority of oxygen and carbon dioxide travel attached to red blood cells. And something that I did not put here on the board, because remember, I'm trying to give you a mind map of, of the overview of blood as a whole, 
uh, is red blood cells and hemoglobin because that's how red blood cells are able to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide for you. They can transport it via hemoglobin, which are protein molecules found inside of those red blood cells. Some things to take into consideration when you're studying about red blood cells are the physical characteristics of red blood cells. You know, they look like they look like a little Werther's originals that are just red. You know, they're 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 characterized as biconcave disc, which is basically saying I got this round thing with two big dimples on both sides. Uh, they can fold over on one another like a sandwich, so they can squeeze through small blood vessels, things like that. Recycling of red blood cells. You know, your red blood cells only live about 120 days if they're lucky. Red blood cells don't last very long. When they get damaged, they can't repair themselves. So you recycle red blood cells a lot. There's not a lot to a red blood cell that you keep. Most of the red blood cell that you keep, you recycle. Is like the iron that is attached to your hemoglobin and the amino acids that make your hemoglobin. Most of the other things in a red blood cell we actually throw away. The function of red blood cells primarily carry gases, carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, and blood typing. Oh, this one gets people a lot. Um, one thing you got to remember about blood typing is that there are two reasons why we call a blood type what we do. Number one, uh, the antigen that is located on the red blood cell, all right? And number two, the antigen that's not on the red blood cell. Um, the, and when you start to study blood typings, you, you understand what that means. If I say that my blood type is A positive, um, then I'm telling you that I have an A antigen on the red blood cell and I have the rhesus factor, that antigen D, D is in door, located on the surface of that red blood cell. If I say that I'm A negative, I am telling you that I have the A antigen located on the surface of my red blood cells and I don't have the D antigen or the rhesus factor located on the surface of my red blood cell. And we'll, we'll do some videos and talk about how to you know, maneuver through blood typing and that kind of thing. If we go back over to transportation, that was just gases. That's how we transport gases. But what about other things? Well, we transport waste products in the blood. Um, uh, as I tell students all the time, you know, you're, you're made up of over 12 trillion cells and all of those cells are like baby puppies. They all eat and they all poo. So, you know, it's nice that you have these nice little cute things called cells, but they are alive and they do what all living things do. So all of that cellular poo gets dumped into your bloodstream and then your bloodstream has to take it and help get rid of it. Therefore, we call it waste products. Heat. Well, red blood cells, um, they're traveling in there, but you don't usually talk about red blood cells and, and, and heat. Typically, you talk about all the other body cells and heat. And your body cells, they're undergoing metabolism, all right? Remember that metabolism is nothing more than the sum total of all the chemical processes happening in your body, which are a lot. And unfortunately, um, the process of making ATP and making energy and that kind of thing in your cells is not a very efficient process. As a matter of fact, uh, a nice healthy chunk, I think somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the energy that your cells make every day is lost as heat. And so that heat gets absorbed by water. That water is the water in your blood. So therefore, the blood absorbs that heat and transports that heat. And then if you follow the dotted line, is what helps you maintain your body temperature. So you are a nice toasty 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit because your blood can measure in at anywhere around 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's carrying all of that heat. Hormones travel through the blood. If you've done the endocrine system at this point, you know that hormones travel through body fluids such as the blood and nutrients travel through your blood. And if you studied hormones, then you already know that hormones help to regulate the nutrient levels that are in your blood. I mean, just talk to anybody who um, has to take insulin shots. Anybody who understands insulin and glucagon knows that those two hormones control um, blood sugar levels in your body. And so um, what's always important is how much of these nutrients are in your blood because they need to be accessible to the cells of your body. The cells of your body treat your blood like a checking account and every cell in your body has a debit card. 
And when they start swiping those debit cards, they are pulling out, instead of cash, they're pulling out nutrients out of your blood for them to use, like calcium, um, like sodium, like glucose. And so when they pull these nutrients out of the bloodstream, we have to keep two things in mind. You pull nutrients out of the bloodstream, the nutrient level in the bloodstream begins to drop. If we put nutrients into the bloodstream, nutrient levels in the blood begin to rise. So if we release insulin, insulin causes blood sugar to drop. The reason why it causes blood sugar to drop is because insulin is traveling through the blood. It comes into contact with target cells. It tells those tar target cells, open up and let sugar in. Well, if they start swiping their debit cards and letting the sugar in from the bloodstream, then naturally blood glucose levels are going to drop. If we move over here to the other item, this is regulation. What is it regulating? Uh, for those of you who are 90 kids, you, uh, 1990 kids, uh, you guys remember uh, Nate Dogg and Warren G, regulators, all right? They regulate, they, they make sure things stay a certain level. Uh, that's a really nice, un-West Coast way of talking about that, but we're not going to go there. But regulation, your body is all about regulating things and keeping things cool. Here we have body temperature. Remember that dotted arrow showing heat? Heat's transported in the blood, and therefore it allows the blood to regulate body temperature. Um, as long as your cells are metabolizing correctly, as long as hormone levels that allow them to metabolize correctly are working good, you produce heat, you transport that heat, it keeps body temperature going good. You mess that up, body temperature will drop. Or maybe uh, you have an infection and your body cells begin to release a different chemical that goes to the hypothalamus, which tells the body to increase body temperature. But that's another chapter for another time. We can also see where the blood helps us regulate body pH by carrying either hydrogen ions or bicarbonate ions. If your body is getting, if the body is pH is getting too basic or alkaline, it can begin to carry more hydrogen ions. And if it's becoming a little too basic, the blood likes to carry those bicarbonate ions. Um, excuse me. Um, if it's getting too basic, it releases hydrogen ions. If it's becoming too acidic, it releases bicarbonate ions. Your blood likes to maintain a general pH within itself between 7.35 and 7.45. If that means absolutely, positively nothing to you, then you have to remember one number. The pH of 7 is neutral. All right? A pH of 7. 7. All right? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. 7. 7 is neutral. It's neither acidic nor basic. It's neutral. It didn't pick a side. So if the pH of 7 is neutral and your blood is 7.35 to 7.45, then that means it's slightly basic, which is good for you because a lot of the waste products that your cells drop off and travel through the blood, oftentimes those waste products are quite acidic. So if your blood stays slightly basic, then yeah, that's a good thing. We can actually balance that out. And then the last thing that we look at when it comes to blood regulation is blood regulates fluid balance. And it really harps on the balance of things between the plasma and the interstitial fluid. Remember, plasma is the liquid portion of your blood, while interstitial fluid is the fluid that surrounds the cells of your body. So when you're talking about the fluid that's around the cells of your body tissues, that's interstitial fluid. Things travel from the plasma into the interstitial fluid and vice versa. Now, the way that we keep things from just rushing out of your blood plasma all into the interstitial fluid and blowing you up like a swollen melon is by osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is oftentimes controlled by large proteins that exist in your blood, in your blood plasma. We'll go into more detail with this when we get to uh, the blood vessel chapter. But this is very important to understand. As long as we have this balance, it's all good. When you mess this balance up, that's when we see a lot of edema, which, of course, is tissue swelling. Uh, if we make our way around the ring, we're still going clockwise. We get over here to protection. 
And for protection, you have white blood cells and you have platelets. Now, I got to hold back from getting uber deep into this um, because we have a, we have some more to talk about this in some latter lessons. But if you look closely, white blood cells deal a lot with protection. So do platelets. Platelets are easy. Platelets deal with blood loss. Now, platelets aren't alive. Well, at least platelets in humans are not alive. Um, platelets are actually cellular fragments that break off of giant cells that exist in your body known as megakaryocytes. First time I heard megakaryocyte, the first thing that came to my mind was Power Rangers and a giant megazord. So you got this gigantic cell that breaks off pieces of itself to fight evil. But, you know, platelets don't actually fight anything. Platelets are not alive. Platelets are these pieces of cell that actually act more like sandbags. If you've ever watched a, a flood on TV, hopefully you didn't have to experience it yourself, but if you saw flood and you saw flooding, oftentimes they use sandbags to stop the flooding. That's what platelets do. Sandbags that stop the bleeding. White blood cells, there's five of these guys, neutrophils, which primarily, you know, attack bacteria. Eosinophils, they primarily attack parasites. Basophils, these are the dudes that, you know, respond with allergies. Um, they're like mast cells. Monocytes, they upgrade into macrophages. So monocytes are more like Bruce Banner. They turn into macrophages, which are like the Incredible Hulk. And lymphocytes, which make, um, make up a nice group. They're 20% of your white blood cells, and they deal with immunity. And they deal with also making things like antibodies. And I'm almost out of time here, which gets me to characteristics of blood. And these are the characteristics of blood, color of blood, the amount of blood. Men generally have more blood than women. Viscosity is like four to five times more viscous than water. The temperature, I told you the temperature, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pH, I told you the pH as well. Well, I'm out of time, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. You got any questions? Let me know. Peace.